am I audible? I'm a Canadian, we don't yell when we speak. Um, so I have been controlling aging for a living for almost four decades. I've been speaking about aging and the science of aging for the last five decades, starting in the 1970s. So I apologize to those of you for whom some of this will be very boring and redundant. Um, I'll just say that um, in terms of my personal uh, point of view, I regard aging as one of the most completely solved scientific problems we have in biology right now. And uh, Aubrey de Grey could well say to me now, as he did uh, 12 years ago when I met him at the birth uh, weekend of SENS in Manhattan Beach, well, Michael, why haven't you done anything about it? And uh, fair, fair point, Aubrey. Uh, today I'm really speaking here primarily to give you practical advice, but because I'm a scientist, and in particular a strong inference scientist, I can't help but couch my advice in the context of strong inference experiments and the <clears throat> demolition of other points of view that would interfere with your doing <laughs> the scientifically correct thing as opposed to perpetual motion machines and so on. Although again, in fairness to my critics, some of them might regard what I'm about to say as in the spirit of, of a perpetual motion machine, but again, that's a critique that could have been applied to the modern physicists in the early days of the 20th century as well. So uh, I have declined a number of invitations to speak at Alcor meetings um, because I didn't really feel I had anything useful to say, but I actually was thinking a lot about this in my drive over here uh, yesterday. And uh, I have even more ideas than I have in this talk, and hopefully I'll be able to get to them if I have time. But this is about how to look good when you do go into your liquid nitrogen. So aging, contrary to popular rumor, is not inevitable. It is entirely in the control of evolution, as Josh Middeldorf and I would agree. We just disagree about how and why it controls aging the way it does. So this is a 10,000-year-old creosote bush, not too far from here in the Mojave Desert of California, which you can see what drive near on the drive to Las Vegas, depending on where you start. And uh, here's a fissile sea anemone. These can live essentially forever. Um, and there's a very profound evolutionary reason for this, and that is that if there's no difference between the products of a fissile reproductive event, then natural selection actively works to build immortality in organisms. And these include eukaryotic metazoa that have telomeres nuclei, all the apparatus that is supposed to inevitably disintegrate with age, but they haven't read the cell biology books of the last, or articles of the last 20 or 30 years, they don't know how to read, so that they, they don't age. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist, I mean a real evolutionary biologist, not a biologist who talks about evolution, but an evolutionary geneticist in, in my origins, and this is how evolutionary geneticists explain aging. We explain it in terms of the falls in two of Hamilton's forces of natural selection. This is the one for the force of natural selection acting on age-specific survival rates. This is probably the one you care more about. Um, before the age, first age in a population at which reproduction starts, this force is at 100%. Um, this doesn't mean that if you have been celibate up until this time, you will not age. This is a population genetics concept, and it refers to what happens in evolution. After reproduction starts in the evolutionary history of a population, the force steadily declines until it bottoms out at zero, sometime around or bef possibly before or after, depending on effective population size, the last age of reproduction in a population, what I call the U. Hefner parameter. Um, now, that's a mathematical theory which I'm just illustrating graphically because I know biologists don't like math. That's why you're biologists or consumers of biology. A corollary of this theory is that this is why evolutionary geneticists feel aging occurs. It's an inevitable result of that decline uh, in Hamilton's forces of natural selection, which in turn must occur in all non-fissile organisms uh, that reproduce using an egg stage just like fruit flies in us. So in the 1970s, I realized that this little B parameter was key for aging and if you could find a way to manipulate little b, the first stage of reproduction in a population, over enough generations, evolution should easily and automatically postpone aging for you, no knowledge of cell biology required. 
Um, and this was an experiment I first did in the 1970s and have been playing with in various ways ever since. And that's the basic idea I, when I'm teaching biology students about this, I call it the med school experiment in that if you go to med school and residency and starting your practice, you'd be crazy to reproduce. You may have sex recreationally, but you don't have sex you know, with the bullets in the gun. Um, and that manipulation of fruit fly aging, not medical student aging, um, is what I did just by delaying the first stage of reproduction in a population of fruit flies, first in the 1970s, then again in the 80s. The most famous experiment of this involved populations we call conventionally B and O populations, their diagram there. So this is now a, a strong inference prediction. I hope you understand what's going on here. It's not a little just-so story. If the evolutionary genetic theory is correct, then you sustain this, these two patterns of reproduction over enough generations, then you have to get what I'm about to show you, which is a substantially slowed process of aging, a substantially increased average lifespan. This was one third of the way through the experiment um, in around 1990 when we had about 100% increase in lifespan. These flies are now owned, the O flies are now owned by Genesient. Are, they're owned by Methuselah flies, least to Genesian Incorporated, and they report uh, more than threefold to fivefold lifespans. So this experiment still goes on and it still gives spectacular results. And the meaning of the result is we have a very powerful scientific theory for aging. All attempts to intervene should at least take this into account, if not exploit it. And non trivially, this was the first time it was possible to go from a powerful formal theory to a straightforward strong inference test, which was passed, unlike, for example, the t tests of somatic mutation theories, error catastrophe theories, and the other theories that I used to argue with biologists about in the 1970s, but you guys mostly won't even remember, because you're too young, actually, um, to remember those. But uh, they were big in the 1970s and 60s, and they're no longer with us, and I expect to see more generations of dead and dying cell biological theories as I continue reading the biological literature. But you're not here to hear about the fights of scientists, really. You're here to, to have a long and active life prior to going to liquid nitrogen. Um, so here's the poster babe, Madame Jeanne Calmont. She lived 122 years. She showed, sold paintbrushes to Vincent van Gogh. And how and why was this possible? If you know the demography of human aging and you know what the death rates are like, and more importantly, the acceleration in death rates that occurs going into our 80s, there's actually statistically almost no way that an individual in a population of seven billion people could live that long. This is why she lived that long. This is the death rates per year in English women who lived primarily in the 19th century and died in the early 1900s. It's Larry Muller's reanalysis of data published in 1939 by Greenwood and Irwin. And unlike the continued acceleration in our death rates shown by human populations historically, as long as we've had demographic data. By the early 90s, these women showed as effectively stable um, or just slowly increasing death rates, which was staggering. And this is part of data like this or part of what uh, Larry Muller and I have been working on for the last 16, well, 18 years. Does aging stop? And if so, why? How? Uh, in 1992, there was a breakthrough moment in aging research when uh, the labs of Jim Kurtzinger and Jim Carey published really definitive high-quality data on very late-life patterns of survival, data that you can't question the way you can most certainly question human data. That's the Drosophila result. Here's the MedFly result. Now, I should point out uh, those are adult age in days on the x-axis and the y-axis is a logarithmic scale of mortality, what the organisms were during the post-aging phase. But then I started thinking about it, and yeah, the cessation of aging depends on environment. It's not just some cosmically absolute evolutionary biological factor. It's environmentally sensitive, like, in fact, most things in aging. So I started thinking about the evolutionary theory behind that, and what we're going to be talking about toward the end of the talk, particularly, is diet. And let me just start by saying these experiments come from fruit flies because it's very hard to do strong inference experiments with humans. 
you don't fit into plexiglass cages in my lab very easily. <clears throat> we in my lab have been keeping our fruit flies on banana medium for approaching a thousand generations. Now fruit flies in nature are equally happy to live off the rot of banana or orange. Just so happens we ha they haven't had any exposure to oranges, certainly in the last, uh, I'd say 40 years, if not longer, in the fruit flies that I work with. So let's talk about humans, because you're not fruit flies, you don't give a damn about fruit flies. Um, in my lab, for the last uh, decades, banana food has been the natural environment uh, for our flies. What is the natural for humans and why should you care about it? Well, the natural is what you're adapted to. So the natural reflects your evolutionary history. And the key to using some of these evolutionary tricks that I'm going to be describing is dealing with the natural and your relationship with the natural. So what does that mean? Well, this is now a very popular topic in all kinds of books and literature. We're going through an explosion of food consciousness. And the obvious thing to say, which now many, many people are saying, is the natural is not the industrial food style or lifestyle, activity style. It is not sitting all the time behind a wheel of a car in front of a computer screen or listening to some boring talk by an evolutionary biologist. It is not consuming Twinkies. It is not consuming vast quantities of high fructose corn syrup. It is not watching a large amount of t television rather than socializing with people face to face. But that leaves unanswered the question of which is the natural lifestyle for us. Is it the agricultural lifestyle that most people on Earth have in their ancestry over the last few thousand years? Or is it instead the hunter-gatherer lifestyle that the paleo movement believes is our natural lifestyle that we must still be adapted to because we only adopted the agricultural way of life at most 10 to 20,000 years ago, depending on your ancestry? Now, as an experimental evolutionist who makes populations evolve in the lab for a living, I was not very impressed with the paleo argument for a very long time. And a lot of my work um, away from aging has involved questions like uh, evolutionary domestication, which involves taking populations from one environment, giving them a brand new one, and watching them evolve. And in particular, I did a lot of this work with Dr. Margarita Matos of the University of Lisbon. In a long series of publications over the last 15 years, we've shown that adaptation to a novel environment works very well within about 100 generations which in turn suggests that Eurasian ancestry populations should generally be adapted to what I would call an organic agricultural lifestyle, manual labor, moderately high population densities, because that's what most of you have had in your ancestry uh, for way more than 100 generations. But there's a mistake in that line of reasoning. And the mistake ironically involves Hamilton's forces of natural selection. And I conceptually realized this mistake about two and a half years ago, which is why I gave a series of talks in 2010, where I used this slide. And the basic concept is um, Hamilton's forces of natural selection are not just going to tune aging itself. They will also tune your adaptation to a novel environment. This is me reasoning verbally, which I've already told you not to do. Um, so if this basic idea is correct, then we are well adapted to an agricultural diet when we're young, but we're no longer well adapted to it when we're older. It's sort of like the turning of one of those giant uh, fire ladder trucks going around a corner. The front end may turn perfectly, but it's the back end that's not really turning very well, unless you have a steering wheel at the back. So that's the verbal concept. And since having the verbal concept for two and a half years, we've actually been working on this as scientists using explicit uh, calculations and experiments. And that's why I'm here today, to give you some of these. So this is the formal analog of that. This is what happens when you do a simulation of age-dependent adaptation to a novel environment. This is done by Larry Muller and one of his incoming graduate students, Kevin Fung. And what you see here is if your starting environment has an optimum phenotype, which is the lower solid line trajectory, but in the new environment, your optimum phenotype value is the upper solid line. Then at early ages, you get a spike of adaptation really fast. The 1,000, 5,000, and 10,000 numbers are the number of generations of adaptation to, the, to this new environment. And what it shows is a very rapid rate of adaptation to the novel environment at young ages. And as you get older, that progressively tails off. What this means is 
all of you consuming an agricultural diet are undergoing an amplified process of aging where you are not only losing your sort of basal, sorry, environment independent uh, adaptation to getting older, dealing with your life history, you're also losing your ability to cope with a diet heavy in grains and dairy products if you still use them. That's a formal simulation. Let's get back to fruit flies. So any idea that's going to work in hardcore explicit mathematical theory should also work experimentally. Now earlier I mentioned that just for a thousand generations roughly we've been exposing our fruit flies primarily to banana. A thousand or more generations ago I'm sure they would have been equally happy on uh, banana or orange. What happens if you switch them from banana to orange or backwards? Switch them orange to banana. The theory I've just shown you suggests they should do systematically worse in orange, but that if you switch them back to banana, they should do better. And this is what I'm going to show you. So upper left-hand corner is all banana versus all orange. And uh, in orange, in that particular graph anyway, the higher mortality rate, this is a plot of mortality rate against age in days, um, the orange-fed fruit flies are systematically dying off faster. And if you uh, switch them too late, you don't get much of a recovery. But in the lower right-hand corner, what I'm showing you is an early switch from orange back to banana. And what you see is a recovery of the survival pattern going back onto the banana trajectory. So what this is showing is if you switch to an environment to which you are better adapted, your pattern of death will slow down. These are mortality rates, not survivorship plots. I hope that's clear enough. This is your age-specific death rate, like in the Cary Kurtzinger data. So here is the, the practical payoff of our research program so far. And we have another decade of more theory, more experiments, and so on to do what we do in the Rose Lab, which is hammer things to death. Um, here's how to control your aging from what our experiment suggests so far. Um, before the age of 30, uh, depending on your ancestry, I recommend an Andrew Wild type organic diet. Um, heavy on the grains and all that wholesome goodness and not, no Twinkies television or sedentary lifestyle, of course. But after somewhere between 30 and 40 years of age, if you have agricultural ancestry, you will want to shift to a more paleo lifestyle. And this will slow your aging pattern. And for very complicated reasons we're working on, we think it will also lead you to stop aging earlier as well. Um, if you don't have agricultural ancestry, put down the bread, put down the milkshake, don't ever touch any of that stuff again. Use the best of modern medicine to lower your mortality level during the last decades of aging and during the late life plateau. Um, now, lest you think otherwise, I'm all for repair and many of the specifics of fixing cells and tissues I'm all for. Don't, don't get me wrong about that. Um, so I'm all for repair, and I think repair at the cell and tissue level is going to be spectacular. Now, driving here, I realized that there's a, a very different line of research that we work on that I don't have slides for today, which is death spiral research, uh, which is primarily Larry Muller's. I just was involved at the beginning of it. And death spiral research is all about when you're you know, starting to circle the toilet and going to go down to the sewer in the sky, as it were, to mix metaphors. Um, so one of the things we had to work on technically, and it's very complicated, is to work on what happens to functional characters as you start to die in demographic uh, cohorts in our lab, again, fruit flies. And what we now know is there are very distinctive signatures of what is going on when an organism is starting to die, which happened way before you're actually dying. And what I realized, this would be very important for Alcorn members. Because as that whole angle, assuming you do everything I tell you to do here, you're going to slow your rate of aging. You might hit the plateau much earlier. You might actually do so in pretty good shape. Um, but you're still at risk of dying. So what can you do if you're on a plateau and you're in reasonable shape, but then something hits you, which might be cancer, a particular kind of um, clot in your 
uh, coronary arteries or brain? Well, that's the death spiral. Um, and uh, Larry Muller's research suggests we might be able to identify people very early. If you're an Alcor member, you might then be able to take measures first to you know, notify your Alcor team, secondly to, this would be five to 10 years from now, thank you, work on uh, getting your autologous tissue repair fired up, that is to say, start having explants made of your tissue, start culturing, uh, for example, cardiac muscle tissue, once we can do that without fraud. Uh, you may have heard about the fraud story on the uh, cardiac uh, tissue repair. And you might then be able to stave off cryopreservation, or you might go into prior cryopreservation but be pulled out relatively sooner. So I'd be happy to talk with you guys more about this than idea I just had yesterday. But uh, there's a lot that you can do with the practical problems of aging and living indefinitely, which I would contend you can accomplish if you start from the correct starting point, which is that aging is not a cell biological process of accumulating damage. It involves cell biology, it involves damage, repair is good. But it is fundamentally about detuned adaptation, and thus the ways in which your particular, you as a human now, um, the ways in which your adaptation has become detuned because of your diet, for example, and your lifestyle, is a non-trivial part of preparing yourself to look really good in cryopreservation. I'd like to thank these people, and including Christina Ritza, who's in the audience today. Thank you.